Um, but before we start, I wanted to share some good news. I wanted to share some less good news and some better news. And then uh, we'll turn to our panel. Uh, the good news is that I just came from two days of board meetings with the US Global Leadership Campaign. It's a group of military veterans, faith leaders, business people from across the country who have come together to really make the case for America's global engagement, and particularly to make the case to the Congress uh, that it is worth paying for and that there's a value that the American people get in return and can see in local communities. So the good news I have is that you are not alone. There is a network across the country that's also working for exactly these same things. Uh, the less good news is that we have to keep making this case because even though I see that we are increasingly effective, I also recognize that we have many, many, many new members of Congress just in the last couple of years, and they need to hear from you. They need to hear from all of us. Uh, the slightly better news, or the somewhat better news, is our experience is that when people like you in the district, in their communities, from a variety of different backgrounds are reaching out and making the case, uh, we really see that whether you are a hawk or a dove, a liberal or a conservative, uh, a fiscal conservative, or someone who believes more in government spending, there's really a persuasive case to make on global engagement for all of those constituencies. Uh, so we all need to be out there. I really applaud and thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, and now we'd like to turn to our panel and get some great advice on how to make the case most persuasively. Um, so I won't give the full bios, but let me just uh, give you the, the highlights here. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, my old friend, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, Kurt is the executive director for international leadership at the McCain, in executive director at the, of the McCain Institute for International Leadership. He's the former US permanent representative to NATO, which is one of the most distinguished diplomatic jobs uh, in foreign policy. Uh, and he has 30 years of experience working in national security issues and across multiple administrations. Uh, to his left, we have Ambassador Barbara Stevenson. Uh, Barbara is uh, president of the American Foreign Service Association. She was herself a diplomat for more than 30 years. She was ambassador to Panama. She was uh, the first woman to be the deputy chief of mission and charge d'affaires at our embassy in London, which is one of our most important embassies around the world. Uh, and then to her left, uh, we have uh, Brigadier General Stephen Cheney. He is the CEO of the American Security Project. He was also in the Marine Corps for 30 years. He was the COO of Business Executives for National Security. Um, and so I think you have here literally 90, more than 90 years of experience in diplomacy <laughs> and defense. I just like to point out that Scary. 30 years ago, I was a, a waitress in a big boy restaurant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But that was its own form of instruction. Um, so I'm going to turn to our more, uh, our more distinguished guests here uh, to get some advice. And I'd like to ask you all, um, in your view, how do exchanges advance national security? How do we make the case? How do any of us make the case at a time when there are so many competing national security priorities on our plate? Kurt, do you want to start? Uh, sure, I'll kick off. And, and let me say a few introductory words, too. So one is that I'm the product of exchanges. So I was a high school exchange student through the Rotary programs in Sweden. I then studied abroad when I was in college and studied in France. Uh, those are the first two times I had lived abroad and that kind of gave me the bug to do more international affairs. I ended up in the Foreign Service and just continuing to, to pursue that experience of living both in the United States and outside the United States. Uh, at the McCain Institute, we now sponsor exchanges. We have our Next Generation Leaders Program where we look for emerging leaders, mid-career professionals from around the world. Uh, we give them a year of professional development in the United States. Uh, that is an individual placement. It's not an academic placement. We find a host organization relevant to what they do. We have a strong emphasis on developing uh, core values and character and professional development in their fields. And we work with them on uh, training and ethics, values, leadership, uh, media, communications. And we also work with them on individual action plans so that at the end of this year, 
they have a plan as to what they're going to go do, how they can bring about change uh, in their own environment. Uh, this is an effort to try to invest in emerging leaders around the world, and it's done without any public money. And I say that because one of the things, the themes here is we're sitting here on Capitol Hill, we're getting a message from Secretary Kerry, uh, we're talking about budgets, but uh, it's not only about public money. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that I think as a society we can look at and invest in and find partnerships with, with the private sector and building public-private partnerships. So that's a pitch on, on some of the things that we're doing in, in exchanges. Uh, when you get to Kristen's question about national security, I would uh, lay it out this way. I start from a very strong conviction that uh, values, uh, democracy, market economy, human rights, rule of law, good governance, security, these are universal human values. They're, they're all written down in the, universe, in the UN Declaration on um, you know, uh, Universal Human Rights. They are things that are shared by people around the world, just not shared by governments around the world. And I think one of the things that exchanges do is help people see that, in fact, despite our different cultures, despite our different governments, despite our different upbringings, we do have, as humanity, a common set of values and a common set of commitments. Um, that, I think, is very, very powerful because if people can see that, at some early stage in their lives, it will stick with them and will affect the decisions that they make as they go further on into life. That brings up the second point, which is in addition to then values then, it becomes a clear interest. The United States is best served by being in an environment in the world where those values are respected, upheld, cherished. If we see a world where those values are trampled on, whether it's by dictators, or whether it's by extremists, or whether it's by mercantilists, uh, or nationalists, xenophobes, fascists, whoever it is, we suffer from that. That is not the kind of world where the United States is going to do the best and is going to prosper. So seeing a world that reflects our values is a very distinct national interest of the United States. And that is one that is directly impacted by uh, these programs. And then uh, finally, uh, I think the, the choice of individuals in exchanges is key because I think it, it is imperative to focus on leadership. Uh, building cross-cultural and cross-national understanding generally is a great thing. But if we can be choosing the right sorts of people from many walks of life, not just political leadership, but business leadership, cultural leadership, academic leadership, journalism, civil society leadership, entrepreneurship. If we can pick the right people there, we can have a tremendous impact on shaping the environment that our country will be living in for years to come. Thanks. Barbara, what would you like to add? Well, like Kurt, I'm a, also a product of way too many exchange mm -hmm. programs in my, my youth. My first one was uh, living with a family in Bogota, Colombia and studying Spanish. And then I went on and did another program in Austria and another one in Greece. And then really the path before me was set. I really had the, the bug. And I have to say, exchange programs have been one of the most powerful tools that I've had at my disposal through my 30-year diplomatic career. And I wanted to tackle, the, one of the questions on the website is this fascinating one. How do we balance the long-term goal of building mutual understanding with the short-term role that exchange programs can play in supporting foreign policy priorities. And I thought maybe I would just share one example that I think everybody can get that really shows that sometimes you can have your cake and eat it too, and that, that maybe is what we should be after. Um, I first should just say I'm a big fan of exchange programs for that basic reason of getting people to um, overcome their mistrust of America. There's nothing quite like coming here and experiencing our optimism and our innovation and our hospitality to you know, create the groundwork for you to be able to work with somebody going forward. Um, what people say when they come back from these programs, though, always surprises me. So I think it's about our dynamism and our innovation. And I asked the um, Muslim girls in Cologne, in Panama, what most struck them after their visit to the United States. No one throws trash and you don't cross at the intersection until the man turns white. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me aback until I thought about 
what it feels like to grow up in a pretty corrupt country where every dream you ever had was squashed every single day by corruption and to be in a country where there's just a basic respect for the rule of law and for kind of liberty and justice for all. This is really what they took away in watching us play by the rules. So it's fascinating what people come up with. Um, in Northern Ireland, I was the Consul General from 2001 to 2004. And it's a country where the United States enjoys sky high approval ratings. Um, many good reasons for that. Family ties for the beginning. Um, 40 million Americans self identify as being of Irish descent. And of course, who helped um, Northern Ireland overcome three decades of conflict between Catholics and Protestants? That would have been the United States. And we're up at the Senate, so we should tip our hats to Senator George Mitchell, who actually brokered that agreement. And Barbara, who was Consul General in Belfast. And, and Kurt, who was my NSC director <laughs> and who gave me invaluable support. <laughs> so you might think that this would be a place where you didn't really need exchange programs, because you didn't need to overcome mistrust and misunderstanding. But exchange programs are this highly uh, flexible tool that you can use for all kinds of reasons. The big challenge that I faced was um, the peace support for that peace agreement that we were so invested in was starting to fray, and a huge challenge was in front of us, and it was converting the police force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, from a kind of paramilitary counterterrorism force into the police service of Northern Ireland that would be follow community policing models and win the support of the Catholic population. So the consulate supported an exchange program that took the entire new policing board of Northern Ireland to, to the United States, to Washington, to Boston, to New York, to look at the best examples of community policing from some of our big city, best big city police chiefs. So the board brought together political leaders from both sides of the divide. So Catholics and Protestants went on this trip together. Everybody in Belfast was betting that this was gonna be a big failure. Nobody thought the policing board would be able to withstand the political strains. And um, the first challenge they faced was they had to come up with a new badge, a new symbol. And everybody just, the, the bets were like 100 to 1 that this would be pulled off. So I'm telling you the story because you know how it ends, right? <laughs> the policing board came to America and came back as this co cohesive entity that even when every other political institution crumbled, and the parliament did, it was taken down for two years after a, a police raid that probably should never have happened. That policing board held together, and it held the peace agreement together, and it oversaw the transformation of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which was at that point um, barred by Congress from receiving aid from the United States into one where one member of Congress earmarked money to help them with their transformation. So I want to say that the program achieved all the things you would say normally that you would want from an exchange program. They um, got to look at the, how we do things. We established um, ongoing relationships with these terrific police chiefs. But you know what? It also delivered on the, the, the most important pressing goal that we had at the time, which was to save the peace process. And Everybody gives us credit for this. To this day, every time the badge comes up, people will turn to me and say, it was you guys who made that possible. It was you who kept, kind of kept hope alive through a moment when there wasn't any. Exchange programs can do amazing things, long term and short term. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Steve. Well, Kristen, thank you. And I want to thank Global Ties for this whole forum. I think it's fantastic. Now, I'm not exactly the beneficiary of an exchange program. All my tours overseas were ordered by the Commandant of the Marine Corps. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I went to Asia and the Middle East uh, voluntarily, of course, but uh, it wasn't exactly fire. an exchange program. That's right. <laughs> um, let me talk for just a second about the American security product and how we have formed, because it bears directly on the question. Ten years ago, Sec uh, Senators Kerry Hagel, Hart and Rudman, and Secretary Kerry at that time was coming off a campaign. Uh, was not happy about how, when he talked about things like energy security, climate change, uh, nuclear security, public diplomacy, was always kind of painted as a left-wing liberal leaning. And, he, and the thought was, who will Congress and the general public listen to if they're not going to listen to them? So of those four, there were two Republicans, two Democrats. They said, can we not get eight or nine or ten military officers, recently retired, three and four star, two from each service, and let them talk from a non-political perspective about all these issues 
uh, purely about their impact on national security. And these were superb military experts, and some are still on a board like Admiral Fox Fallon, the former Central Command commander. So they took all those topics on, and we've carried them on to today. And the whole intent was to paint them from a national security perspective and not now lead in the exchange portion of the program. You won't find a military officer, certainly of that rank or anybody's career, who hasn't done multiple tours overseas, if not many, many years in, in all the cases. And you will also find that they all have been extremely well educated, whether it's going to the Command and Staff College or the War College or graduate education. Uh, I would say your average colonel these days has two master's degrees plus. But I don't point that out to brag about them. I pointed out that each one of these schools that I have attended has had a number of foreign students in those schools. The IMET program and the foreign training program brings these students from overseas, and on every, any given day, there are six to 7,000 of them in the United States who are being trained by the United States military. And we develop great, close, personal relationships. And I've got several anecdotes. One, for instance, uh, one of my classmates at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, and this is a while back in the mid-'80s, uh, became Commandant of the Thai Marine Corps. And I point that out because these officers come here and they learn our way of life. They form personal relationships. They learn to trust us. We learn to trust them. And many of them go back to uh, policies and governments that don't exactly lean democratic, and their play in their government might be significantly more than perhaps our military might be here today. So as you saw what happened in Thailand, uh, military coup, uh, we didn't train them to do that, but, but they understand where the United States is coming from. And another anecdote, if you will, since 1956, 4,600 officers from, the, from Tunisia have trained here in the United States. I'm not going to claim credit for the fact that they did not open fire on the protesters in Arab Spring because they trained here in the United States, but I think it was probably in the back of their mind, they're sitting there thinking about, hey, we're military officers, we should follow our political establishment, we have civilian leaders, uh, we don't need to foster a coup here and murder our own citizens. The United States military, as you're all well aware, has a uniform code of military justice. We adhere to the Geneva Convention. We respect rights, and we teach all that to them as well. And, and that's taken back to all the countries and all those people that go back there. And then, of course, when we go overseas, we take those same traits and characteristics and parlay that to them as well. And I don't mean to say that we don't teach warfighting skills. We do. We're the best in the world at it. But that said, the other piece is, in my opinion, far more important what they're learning about being in the United States, what they're learning about character, honesty, integrity, treating your people right, uh, is far more important than what they're learning on the warfighting skills side of the house. So you see this every day in every country all the time. And I'll give one last anecdotal example. Uh, I did a, an exchange program actually up at Harvard where they take 20 Russian admirals and generals and 20 US, put us together for about three weeks. It's, it's usually done in January. Why they picked that month, I don't know, but maybe the Russians like the cold. Uh, but there was one case where a Russian admiral graduated or left that program, went back, and in 2006, the Russians had a submarine that got entangled in fishing nets in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and they were desperate because they didn't have the assets to recover it. He picks up the phone and calls one of his classmates from that particular program who happened to be working in the embassy in Moscow, a Navy, U.S. Navy admiral. We got an asset out there. We got them untangled and got it back. But it's that kind of trust that they established between the two of them that they were able to talk, even Russia and US, and hopefully de-conflict what could have been a very serious problem, certainly for them. And of course, you see some of this playing out in the Middle East. So that's where I think exchange programs are most valuable for the military. And these numbers are not small. Uh, when I talk six or 7,000 foreign military here, we've got hundreds, hundreds of US military who are attending schools and education programs overseas. And of course, many, many more that, that are being assigned overseas as well. So that's where I think they're so important, Kristen. So you've heard from Ambassador Volker that these are programs that help to promote human rights, universal values that Americans but others around the world care about. You've heard from uh, Ambassador Stevens that um, uh, Stevenson, sorry, you've heard from Ambassador Stevenson that these are programs that advance diplomatic interests, they advance values like the rule of law. And you've heard from General Cheney that these are programs that advance U.S. national security, but also security interests globally. And to that, I'll add, these programs also have a great return on investment. I mean, I just read in the newspaper this morning the F-35 program, still not done. Estimates will be that will cost one trillion with a TR trillion uh, when it's done. 
And you know, I think uh, whether you're for the F-35 or against it, I think when you stack up all the exchanges over the years and all their value, I doubt they approach $1 trillion. And I think the value they bring back to the United States is really significant. And that's something we need to highlight as well, return on investment in, in addition to absolute, absolute value. I thought um, what you were going to say was that who would stick with such a program unless they well, had been in an exchange program? <laughs> I refer you to a report published uh, that I worked on many years ago by defense experts to question that. Uh, but that's not the topic of our discussion today. We're, we're unifiers. Um, the, uh, the point I wanted to bring up next, though, is now that we've all agreed that we're for, for good and justice and security, I'd like to also ask us to be a little bit reflective ourselves, because even with all the good that we're all doing, we can always do better, and we really need to do better. And not just need to do better, we need to evolve with the times. We can't just keep running the same old programs the same old way and expect to continue to convince people that these programs have value. Uh, so my next question for the panel is, is exactly that. How do we do better? How do we make sure that these programs keep evolving to make sure that they're the, the, they're the best they can be in order to advance America's national security priorities? How do we show the taxpayers that they're getting their money's worth? Well, I can take that up a little bit, Chris, as I mentioned some of the examples that I had here, but if you expand that to far greater number of countries than we're currently serving, you can get that much better. And, and talking about the return on investment, certainly um, at the cost of what it costs for IMET today, it's a nothing compared to the F-35, but I think the return would just be fantastic. Um, the numbers could be increased, and we could do other countries, and we could certainly make approaches to those who are not necessarily allies of ours that could come here and help train. That's why I mentioned the Russian program up at, the, up at Harvard, which is, that's been going on for oh, about 30 or 40 years now plus, but that's pretty much stagnant. I mean, it stayed the same for the whole time. It, it, those things could be enlarged greatly. Of course, everything all comes back, of course, to funding to Capitol Hill and who's, who's providing the money. And a lot of people say, why do you go to a DOD? It's like, why did Willie Sutton rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Um, and the DOD does have discretionary money, and they do the, do these programs, and they understand the value of them. The Foreign Area Officer Program, just to give but one example, which could be greatly expanded, I think DOD has taken that in mind, but they could even push that even farther. So I, I recommend to everyone, and we've got copies of the, um, the Foreign Service Journal in the back. Um, I think they're on that back. Um, where are they? They're right there. They're right, right behind you if you want to pick it up. There is a great article in the November edition of the Foreign Service Journal that AFSA, my organization, produces by Jennifer Clinton, the president of Global Ties, that looks on the way forward. And she has some great concrete suggestions because, yes, we want money and we want to justify it, but there are some ways you probably could trim costs a little bit on a per capita basis without losing bang for the buck. So I think it really is worth looking as can you go from three weeks to two? Can you use technology to help keep people connected afterwards? I think that these programs work, though, because they're about forming relationships between Americans and foreigners and between the other people that go on the trip. And that can't be sacrificed. But here's my kind of radical thought. I've administered the, um, some of these programs, and especially the International Visitor Leadership Program, and I believe that it's time for us to, it's had dual roles. One of them has been to you know, overcome mistrust and get people to understand that the United States was a good and benevolent power. That's important. There's been another goal where you sent people who had a common passion. So these were people who cared about solid waste management or they cared about rising acidification in the oceans. They care about all kinds of issues that are really emerging on the global agenda, about how do you keep the internet free and also secure. Um, so I think that that is where we should be moving toward as the primary goal for most of our exchange programs, which is being quite clear that what we're trying to do is identify the partners that we're going to work with over the long term to actually advance the agenda on this new kind of what I call the new threat set. So it's things like the oceans, which have a, a range of... of, of um, governance issues and there is no government entity you can go call on because oceans don't have a government. Cyberspace is another area where you have to bring in a set of non-traditional partners if you're going to address that. None of us are really fully up to, to speed yet to address cyberspace. 
outer space is also an issue. There are a set of issues that don't respect borders. It's um, pandemics and mass migration. So as we gear up to try to find the stakeholders that we're going to work with to get agreements that cross borders, I think that the, these programs that are built around that topic with the express purpose of finding the partners, cultivating them, forming a network, and then having the network endure. Nice. Right now, the alumni network is a little bit of an afterthought, and it can be hard to keep those going, because unless people have a shared passion, they don't know why they should keep coming together after they were alumni of our programs. But if you started with the shared passion, went on the trip, and then you've got actually the inputs that you need to keep an alumni network alive and vibrant, and is a really effective tool for the new, more networked kind of diplomacy that I think we're going to be doing in the years to come. Hmm. Kristen, if I could just add one piece to that, the, uh, <laughs> that on the same on the alumni perspective, that uh, I know Congress has railed on DOD a little bit about tracking alumni and the relationships, uh, with good reason, in my opinion. That nobody ever came back to me and said, of all these foreign students that you went to school with, how have you followed up with them? What, how did you keep that relationship going? And, we, we did it out of personal uh, responsibility and, and wanting to foster those relationships, but we can do a much better job on the alumni side of the house. So if I can add a few thoughts onto this then. Um, we actually, at the McCain Institute, put a lot of thought exactly into this question because we were designing a program from scratch. So we didn't have to be burdened with what we had already done. We could, we could figure out what we wanted to do. Uh, so some of the things that you mentioned, I would absolutely agree with and, and just starting for example with the alumni network uh, we thought that was the whole point of the program it's not what it's not the year that people spend in the u.s doing something so what do they do after that and why does that matter so we build into the program the network itself uh, we use technology for that we have a a, a version of linkedin we have a staff member who prompts discussion in there and one of the things that we also do as part of this is we work individually on action plans. So everyone has a mission. They're supposed to go and do something. When we interview people into the program, we ask them, what is it that you're trying to do? What would you like to fix? And then based on that, we work with them over the course of a year so that at the end of a year, they have an actionable program. Then we follow up with them to see how they're doing and their colleagues follow up with them to see how they're doing, and, and that dialogue continues. And then most recently, we're also introducing an award, a cash award, for the best implementation of a leadership action plan so that we keep people focused on trying to, to build that. And that's for, you know, for them, it's because of their passion that they came into it with, but for us, it's motivating that whole network of people. Uh, a couple other things. Um, and these are maybe more biases than, than you know, don't, don't take this with a grain of salt, but these are some of my biases. I think there's been a drift away from values or towards being more values neutral in the way we have gone about discussing programs and issues and cross-cultural differences. And I think that's a mistake. I think our strength is our values. And I think, therefore, when we have exchange programs, we should include a, a good element of civics, governance, uh, democracy, human rights, freedom, all the things that we are passionate about, build that into the program and, and make sure that we're not just saying, well, take what you want, leave what you want, you know, it's, it's all equal. It's not. We have, a, we have a point of view in this. That's one thing I would do. Um, another thing I would do is, I think there's been, this is contradicting Barbara a little bit, uh, I think there has been a drift away from uh, allies toward developing countries uh, towards conflict zones, countries that are struggling in transitions. Those are all important. And you know, obviously, you want to do everything. Uh, but I think we're at a point where we should be thinking about our allies and our alliances. Uh, European Union, for example, has the Erasmus Fellows uh, program where people can study throughout the European Union as if they're studying in their home country for free. Well. That's making it really expensive for European college students to come to the US. So we should be thinking about ways to get that exchange going again, because we're losing out on that. Mm. Uh, we have a, a member in our Next Generation Leaders Group now from Japan. And the feedback we got as we got this person in from Japan was that nobody reaches out to them. 
And they were so delighted, this, this Japanese foundation that we're working with, that we came to them to suggest that we, we want to develop that partnership more. So I think focusing on alliances is something I would do. Another thing I would do, and this gets to your point about taxpayer money, I would build more into the programs public-private partnerships. Uh, I think that one of the things that makes uh, those who are signing the checks for our government feel better is that someone is joining them in doing so, that it's not just a taxpayer-funded thing. That, uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in that and a lot of ability to do that. Uh, we, we, as I said, have done this all as uh, private donations, private sector funding. We'd be happy to, to, to be part of building public-private partnerships in that area as well, but I think that would, that would help. Final point would be on... Um, and this I think that we do a good job on as a government, is thinking clearly about the length of the programs. Uh, the short programs, sometimes you can access people who don't have more time, and sometimes you can access more people because it's cheaper for a shorter period of time. All good. Longer programs are more life-changing, and so you have more passionate and more dedicated advocates and, and people who are going to be more deeply committed to carrying forward what they get out of their exchange program by a longer period of time. Uh, we started with a long program of a year. We then added in a three-week program um, for those very reasons. But I think at least being conscious of what choices we're making as we do that, there's a value to both. <coughs> and I just want to echo uh, what Kurt said about public-private partnerships and leveraging private money uh, for two reasons, really. One is, this is a time when there are so many competing priorities uh, for the U.S. budget, government's budget, that, you know, honestly, the idea that we're going to see a radical increase in funds for exchanges is a, is a bit hard for me to, to fathom or predict at this stage. Given that, if we all really believe so much in the value of exchanges, I think it's really incumbent on us to go out and try to find some new resources in our communities from corporations, from foundations uh, that will help support these programs going forward. In addition, I think it only helps us make the case to the Congress uh, because as Kurt pointed out, this idea of leverage is very persuasive. If you say to a member of Congress, no, you're not just paying for this government funded program, you're creating leverage, because you're leveraging, uh, I saw Rebecca Bell before, what is it, three, three dollars for every one dollar of U.S. investment in YALI by the university partners? I don't say our, anyway, I think it's three to one. Yes, is it three to one, Rebecca? Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, that really helps to make the case to members of Congress, because they say, wow, I'm getting a good deal for the taxpayer. Uh, so I just want to give the... Yeah. Can we add on to that, too? Yeah, please. Be my guest. I agree with that completely which means there's also, we ought to make it easier to work together. Amen. <laughs> it is so hard for the private you know, NGOs, foundations, and businesses yeah. to work with the government. As yeah. much as they would like to, the government makes it so hard. Yeah. So simplifying that process, making it easier, that would be extremely, extremely helpful. So I'm going to turn to all of you. I know you have many questions for these uh, fine people, but before I do that, let me just ask our panel if, they, if you have any final words of advice for this group. If you could give one piece of advice about how we make these programs more effective, how we advocate for them more effectively and persuasively, how we really position ourselves as a community for the future. I mean, what would it be? These, everyone's here because they're trying to do this even more effective. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I just, when I address other audiences, a lot of time I get a lot of ignorance about exchange programs and about the United States military in particular and about what we're doing with foreign countries. And, uh, and, and they don't understand that we've got a million ambassadors for us here that are that are all going to serve overseas at one time or another. These young men and women who are the finest our country have uh, are going out and they're going to be they're going to be deployed overseas. So that's their exchange program. So understanding that they're going to get that experience and then encouraging other countries to bring their military to here, you can have a establish a great relationship. And just so everybody understands that there's a there's a hand in glove uh, symbolic relationship here between them, and I just want people to understand that. I know that trying to come up with metrics that demonstrate the value of exchange programs is diabolically difficult, and the whole bit about the long-term relationships has proven very, very hard to kind of demonstrate, so we do Margaret Thatcher, et cetera. My advice, I think, on this would be to 
do what I, the example I chose was one that I thought people would actually care about the outcome and see how the program actually delivered the outcome. I think a lot of these exchange programs deliver both on the long-term goal of relationships and on short-term goals that tell a story to Congress and to other funders. And I think we should seek to be able to tell those stories clearly, and the, the very act of trying to do that will tie the programs to our national security objectives in a way that I think makes it easier to fight for their funding. I think we've covered a lot of ground. I guess one additional thought is that most of what we've talked about has been foreign visitors to the United States. And I think we should also put a priority on getting Americans out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. All right, now what questions or comments do you have to share? Uh, this uh, lady right here, please. And Can I start back here? Identify yourself uh, when you ask a question, okay. that would be great. Is someone coming with a mic? Yeah. Right up here? <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Melanie, I'm from Detroit, and uh, I actually just wanted to say thank you to Ambassador Stevenson. I actually lived on the White Rock Drive in Belfast uh, in the early 90s, and some of these are very young. They may not even know there was a struggle in Northern Ireland, but I lived with Jerry Adams' brother, so I, I lived very it, nice. and you really were helpful. My question, actually, is uh, are there veterans exchange programs? You know. Um, our veterans who are coming back, dealing with things that we don't understand uh, as civilians. Uh, is, is there any program set up where we could bring back and forth our veterans and theirs who are dealing with PTSD and you know, uh, coming back into society, et cetera? I am not aware of any specific program. Of course, I know a lot of veterans who, who go overseas and work with foreign governments, and I do it routinely, uh, but I, I do it out of interest for it, and, and that's what my organization sponsors. Uh, and we, we do go over, I, all my board members, the, the flag officers I mentioned go there all the time. But I'm not familiar with a specific veterans program to export them overseas as an exchange. And that's a, that's a great recommendation. It's a great recommendation. Closest thing I can think of is the many privately funded programs like Project Children, right? In, not veterans, but children who had been in highly conflictive areas brought to the United States for a summer to just breathe free and clean. But, Veterans never heard of one. Yes, ma'am. I'll give it to you next. <laughs> While we're waiting for the mic, I'll just point out that there are a number of uh, very prominent veterans groups that have gone back on their own, formed NGOs and mm -hmm. other uh, activities in order to help uh, the international development in the communities they were serving yeah. in, because they thought it was very important. So I just wanted to call out that dimension of the issue as well. Yes, ma'am, you have the mic now. Uh, Sherry Mueller with the School of International Service at American University. Um, do you think it would be at all helpful to point out to the Congress the extent of spending on public diplomacy and exchange activities of other countries? Do we talk at all about the Confucius Institutes and the heavy investment the Chinese are making as just one tiny, well, one big example? Thank you. Well, I, I think your question was, would it help? Um, <laughs> and I don't know that, I think that there is a general degree of awareness that a lot of countries like China are doing that. Uh, there is uh, probably a misperception about the degree to which we are doing it uh, in proportion to other things. And my own view about the way some of these decisions are made by the Congress is that they feel paralyzed on any kind of spending that can't be justified as an extraordinarily high national priority because of the, the debts and the deficits and the domestic spending we've got. So uh, you know, the, winning on the merits is, is uh, not gonna work. You know, I, I did a little bit of research before I came in today. When you look at the number of foreign students that are over here, and I believe the Chinese was somewhere in the vicinity of 275,000 or 300,000. It's a phenomenal number, um, which I, I think is a good thing, of course, because they're all going to go back having learned what our civilization is like. Uh, I'm not so sure how aware everybody is of that up here and how much our exchange programs can help balance that a little bit by sending our people over there 
to learn in their institutions. So maybe there's an advantage to that. I mean, I would just say most universities that I am in contact with have been making a huge push to send their students out. I mean, some of them have got goals of 80 or 90 or 100 percent of students having uh, an overseas experience. So I think this is happening mm -hmm. in our country because I think we recognize that if we're going to produce the kind of, you know, global citizens that we need to lead in the coming decades. I don't really see it as a government function so much as I see universities. And this is where it's not that hard, I think, for the private sector to kick in. It's just very hard for the private sector to directly support uh, government programs because our ethics rules uh, are just not set up to enable this to happen. Mm -hmm. I think it may help a little bit on the economic competitiveness side, Sherry. I think it is compelling. Uh, when uh, a member of Congress sees that a lot of Chinese students, for instance, get the chance to go overseas and don't see enough American students speaking Chinese, being able to compete in those markets, I think it adds to the case, but may not be on the, the top of the, the priority list. But certainly, I think the 100,000 Strong initiative, the idea of America's future economic competitiveness what has been one of the compelling cases for that initiative. Yes, sir. It's coming behind it's coming you. Coming around here. Uh, hi, my name is Lauren Hershey. I was a Fulbrighter in India in 1968. Uh, I, I find this a unique and informative uh, uh, panel, and I'd like to challenge you in two different ways. Number one. Uh, we have an election coming up on November 8th. I might be a little bit provocative, but I don't intend to be partisan. And uh, you should be appearing in front of audiences uh, in every major city in the United States as a panel and appealing to <laughs> business leaders Aww, and okay. civic we'll leaders <laughs> in my home city of Cleveland, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in St. Louis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the provocative question is, uh, the question of American demagoguery that we now see on the scene and how, speaking from your hearts and your heads, how do you see that we counter the negative effects of what we have heard over the last six months? And I thank you for your honest opinions and comments. <laughs> Who's going first? <laughs> start, yeah. Their honest opinion. Well, let me start with your first comment. The, at the American Security Project over the last two years, we had a, a funder who I won't divulge today, but had the same point about going around the country and saying, hey, why don't you get your military guys if you're so concerned about climate change and every, everybody else is, you know, the deniers are winning the battle, go out there and, and talk, and we did. And we went to some 20 cities over the last two years and held various public forums, and it was, it, it was great. You know, I, I hate to always bring it back to funding, but when you got somebody who's paying, paying the ride, it's okay. Uh, when you don't, it's kind of tough. So um, I'd take that on for my organization if I had a funder that was going to do it. So that, that's number one. On the demagoguery side, um, geez, I, I, are you referring to the military aspects of it specifically? As broadly as you would too. Yeah, as, I, 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 I mentioned earlier about the military guys being ambassadors, guys and gals. Um, you know, when they, when they encounter foreign nationals and they recognize we're not there to to kill them unless you're ISIS, the, uh, uh, that, hey, we're, we're going to protect them. We understand human rights. You know, we, we train them. We understand women's rights. All that kind of thing has all been, in my opinion, a huge plus. Just look what's happened in Afghanistan with the kids going to school and uh, what we've done in building infrastructure there. Of course, it's, it's been a ebb and wane on that. Um, so I think from the military side, we've gone a long ways to dispelling the demagoguery, if you will, or being the, the, the bull in the china shop necessarily. I'd be interested in the ambassador's take. I mean, thank heaven for the investment we've made in exchange programs. And so we've got people all over the world who have come and spent, um, been, um, received hospitality in American homes. They've experienced this firsthand. And are there warts? Of course there are warts. I have had the occasional person come back and be, you know, um, caught focused on the warts, but that's been once in my entire 30-year career. The other times people left going, you know, the sort of things that you kind of 
are meant to believe about what's wrong with America. When you get there, you realize, and then they'll sort of, you know, run through. You know, we're an open society. Um, we're very welcoming to people from all over the world. The likelihood that the visitor found somebody from that spoke their language or of their ethnicity that was thriving in our country, and this in itself is a great uh, endorsement of us. The people who come on the exchange visits go home and talk to their entire group, whether it's their mosque or their community group or their school about what America is really like and what most Americans are like. Americans don't hate Palestinians. They don't sit and seethe about Muslims. That's not what we do for the most part. I don't quite know what to do about this, so I think I'm just going to pause there. <laughs> <laughs> well, First off, you, you asked for a point of view, an honest point of view. So I don't agree with much of what I've been hearing uh, about, you know, just putting a ban on Muslims coming into the country or building a wall or China stealing all our jobs. It's, it, it is a pandering to anger and fear uh, on both sides of the aisle, frankly. It's not just on one side. But I honestly don't believe it has had that much of a negative impact abroad. Uh, and, and I do travel a fair amount. I think people are not too worked up about this at this point. Um, they look at our election process with a certain amount of awe and disgust. <laughs> and <Sure agree. laughs> and um, the, the reaction I, I have gotten, admittedly more from, from government types um, or national, foreign national security policy types, is worry about what an uh, ill-informed government would actually do, as opposed to um, the, the more emotional and cultural uh, side of this. Uh, I think also there's a, a, a sense of, you know, in other parts of the world, people are having similar feelings. Uh, look at the rise of far-right parties in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Hungary, Poland. Uh, anti-immigrant sentiment in Europe. We had the New Year's Eve uh, rape attacks in Cologne. Um, it's echoed elsewhere. Uh, I think even in parts of the Muslim world, there's a anger and frustration that no one is taking on these terrorists. Uh, that, you know, why are they being tarred by the actions of these crazy people? Uh, so I, I think that, that frustration may be extending around the world a little bit too. Now, that's not to justify irresponsible or, or demagogic uh, statements and, and potentially even leadership here. Uh, thus far, I, I'm not too worried that it has had an impact. I, I worry what would, what would be an impact if we tried to implement some of those policies. So I'll give you two honest answers. The first answer is, with my hat on as a citizen and a human being, I really find the divisive language we've heard in this presidential campaign to be reprehensible. It's immoral. Um, as a national security analyst and a political scientist, I think it's strategically unwise. I would caution against it. Um, but I also want to put in a word of caution not to overread it for two reasons that both have to do with exchanges. One is, you know, Donald Trump is a genius at grabbing headlines. He's great at it. He loves to do it. He's great at it. If you want to tweet, if you want a headline, you know, he's your guy. No one except for maybe The Onion is writing a headline that says, family sits down with exchange student, learns Muslims are nice and just like them, and they all like the same soccer teams. Nobody writes that. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that you know, if I tweet that, nobody's interested. Um, so exchanges do play a big role it's that we don't see. The other thing that exchanges do is over the decades, Thousands and thousands of people have come through this country and come to understand the diversity of our system, the crazy, chaotic marketplace of ideas that is just America, warts and all, and that does help them to interpret these voices that they hear. People who have been through exchanges and understand our system know that no one person speaks for all other Americans. They appreciate how diverse and heterogeneous this country is, and it helps them to put this into perspective and discount some of these voices. So I think that, again, doubly makes the case uh, for exchanges. Uh, yes, so I, I have a question back oh, here, please. Sorry, yes. I'm Annette sorry, Alvarez, Global that. Ties Miami. I appreciate each of you, your comments, your service. I think all of us in this room have these personal anecdotes and experiences. But what would you think of 
finding room without going out to outside funders and public-private partnerships, finding room within some of these exchanges to amplify the, um, uh, the contact with Americans. I, I'm kind of thinking, you know, America unscripted, because as we, as we organize these meetings, we do a great deal of subject matter expert to subject matter expert, um, home hospitality with our members. But we are not doing as good of a job as we could finding room here to, to have more Americans experience and get to know some of these visitors without it having to be topic to topic, expert to expert. And I think that's what we need to pivot towards and we need to look towards, and maybe that would help us have a more rational conversation about the other. Well, I'm going to jump the queue here for just a second, because not only do I agree with you and think you make a great case, my experience is that participants in exchange programs really want this too. I was out in Arizona this summer with the members of the Young African Leaders Initiative, and they had an amazing experience and just raved about the program. The one thing they wanted more of is just to get out, to get out, to get out, to talk to people in the communities, just to have unscripted conversations, go out for coffee. And so I think all of us can do more to build this into the programs. And it's not just for the benefit of the people who are participating in the programs, it's for the benefit of the communities they're going to. You know, there's really so much to learn. Uh, and I think we've heard that again and again. Any of you like to add? Well, I, I agree. And that's the, when we do our one year long Next Generation Leaders Program, that's exactly the way we build it, is that they, we, they're on their own. We find them a professional placement that's going to be good for them. We, we work with them on a plan. But for 12 months, they're out there making their way. And I think that deep immersion and having to cope and having to figure things out yourself, dealing with your local community is, is a huge part of the benefit. Uh, yeah, this lady has had her hand up, so. Trying to get the front end, the back, sorry. Oh, very good, thanks. We'll go in the back for the next one, but you're going to have to help me because I can't see as well. Good afternoon. My name is Muna Abdi. I've been interpreting for IBLB program uh, participants for the past 10 years. Um, my question is related to the uh, effectiveness of having the government as a partner when it comes to private part, uh, public partnership, and especially in the area that I'm interested about that I serve linguistically, the Arab and Muslim world. Um, in the previous session, we had a representative talking about the Global Engagement Office. It is pretty much by its location at the National Security Council. It can coordinate between the different uh, agencies. It can balance between the resources available for the military versus the state and focusing exchange programs targeted towards civilians. But also, they have, um, I have a concern about its sustainability with the changes of administrations and also the politicizing of it, considering the domestic internal politics. What, how can the private sector, um, which I believe in that area, could have more credibility, it has more impact, uh, the entrepreneurship programs, the uh, American uh, genius when it comes to private sector and innovation, it will have a better impact than focusing on uh, civil society uh, uh, organization. It is important, but with the restrictions and totalitarian systems increasing, it's easier business to business to share and promote the American values that way. And that's only my um, question for the panel. My comment also is regarding the current um, political environment that we see during this election. Yes, we have certain par you know, personalities, and we can understand this is the silly season. But what scares many Muslims, not only abroad, but also here, is the masses of supporters. When you see a field uh, that's filled with 20 uh, supporters or spectators, that is the concern, especially for those who would like to promote the American policy, how credible we would be. Who'd like to take well. a <laughs> I can make a quick comment about the National Security Council and having global engagement there. And when you look at the size of the National Security Council over the last decade plus, it's just exploded. To me, this ought to be a State Department program. It should be squarely there. When the, we had the prior speaker talk about she had a staff of five and everybody went, I should run dozens more. We don't need dozens more in the National Security Council. It ought to go right over to State Department. Maybe you have one or two that 
help assist in formulation of the president's policy on it, but that it, yeah. the, the responsibility ought to reside squarely in the State Department and not expand the National Security Council. That's just, that's my uh, little opinion and comment on that. You know, I think when I speak here, I speak very much as someone who's very familiar with a whole array of um, State Department-run government-funded exchange programs. And every time I kind of pick up a rock, I seem to find another kind of an exchange mm -hmm. program. Um, one of our young staff members at AFSA was part of People to People mm -hmm. for many years. And this seems to be exactly this kind of in-home hospitality, unscripted moments. And so there is, um, I think there's probably, we need to be realistic about um, what we're likely to get funding for, for government-funded exchange programs. People are going to want to see bang for the buck and that this actually serves a national security agenda. Trying to get it much broader, which is what our universities do, and I think programs like People to People, I think that, that we probably need to look at the entire array of exchange programs and then try to decide, you know, which is the best horse for which, for which course. Um, and I certainly agree with um, Brigadier General Cheney that uh, you want to get the, uh, the State Department at the center of these. It gives it an institutional home. Mm -hmm. We do all Foreign Service officers swear an, an oath to the Constitution, which um, makes us naturally, as Foreign Service officers, obligated to think in the long-term interest and to serve kind of both parties. So it's a good way to help buffer institutional programs from the vicissitudes of politics. But funding is still funding. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, to your question about the elections, um, I think that it is, it would be very worrying, as you said, to Muslims here or to Muslims around the world to see the, the kind of um, emotional energy, excitement about these negative policies. So you're like, what's going on here? Um, at the same time, I don't know that this can be explained uh, or that it can be credibly explained. But I think that these are people who are genuinely decent people who are afraid and uh, are just looking for some answers when they don't feel like their government is delivering any answers. And I'm not sure that that kind of wave of uh, rabid enthusiasm for what I think are, are distinctly uh, prejudicial policies would last very long. Uh, because I think as people start to see implications of what that would mean for what we are as a country, what are civil liberties, what are human rights, what are basic freedoms, what's the Bill of Rights, uh, people very quickly flip to defend those too. Um, I can see the worry that would exist in other parts of the world. I also see the anger that some people have and also around the world. Uh, and I do think that we, we're, we, we live through a very um, open, aggressive, freewheeling electoral process right now. and We don't know what the outcome will be. But I also think that our institutions as a country are pretty strong, and the values that we have are pretty strong, and the, the potential for backlash against any fundamental change of those core pillars of, of our society will be fierce. And I'll just comment on the, the point about public-private partnerships. I'm a big fan of public-private partnerships. I'm glad we've seen so many more of them. I will confess, sometimes I think we talk about them too much. Sometimes I think we forget that we can have private-private partnerships. We don't need the government's permission to do this. I mean, that's the beauty of living in this country. We can just go and do it if we want to see it happen. I mean, obviously, we have to follow regulations and people need visas, but other than that, it is completely within our capability to design, fund, manage these programs by ourselves without anybody from the U.S. government, you know, all due respect, uh, putting a gold star on our foreheads or, or giving us money. So I'd love to see more of the kinds of exchanges you're talking about. And I'd love to see people really rise to the challenge of creating their own, uh, own initiatives. You know, I'll just pile on one, another anecdotal story. The, uh, the number of friends that I have, some retired military, some not, that are living in Shanghai or Dubai, take your pick. And I, had a, I ran a prep school for several years in Texas prior to coming up back to D.C. 
And one of my board members wanted us to teach Mandarin at the school. Uh, so I said, hey, if you're willing to fund it, I'm willing to do it. Interestingly, China will provide you this teacher for the first two years, free of charge. You just got to put them up. Amazing to me. I mean, literally amazing. And what's equally amazing is the number of students that volunteered to learn Mandarin. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, was, it be instantly became the number one foreign language, more so than Spanish. Of course, we were in Texas, but uh, I, I was shocked. I really was shocked. So there's an exchange program, I had, and this was a business guy who wanted this program instituted on my board. He, he knew the value of having Mandarin taught there because of the number of kids that are going to end up doing business in China. Yeah, and lots of people in our country have done this too, but let's see more of it. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm coming. Yeah. Where was that hand? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to hear, but if, if we're quick, we can have one more. We have five minutes left, so we'll be streamlined. Hi, my name is Ashley Hughes. I'm a former AFS student and independent contractor for FIFA and CONCACAF, the soccer federations. So if you can guess, I am like the American girl in a foreign man's world a lot. So my question to you is less developed than I would like it to be, but I kind of want to see where you go with it. In how you see women in exchange programs, in terms of the ratio between men and women. Because my high school exchange program was primarily female. My college exchange program was primarily male. And then I'm also sort of intrigued by the concept of the military, because there are less women in the military than there are men. And then also how that affects diplomatic relations between military women from the United States and, say, foreign countries, and how that's reactive in, say, a nation like Saudi Arabia, where my rights would be very limited. So I'm going to let you guys go from there and see what happens. Well, it's a great question on the military side. And I look back at my time at those military schools and we had those military exchange students. I think out of the, well, let me see, at the National War College, we probably had uh, 20 or 30 in my class. There might have been one female military, I think. When I was at Command and Staff College, none. Uh, so that's, you know, that it's, of course, we're not the ones to tell them who to send to us. And of course, when you look at the foreign militaries and the percentage of their militaries that are female, uh, which in many cases are much smaller than even ours, um, there's a much smaller pool to put in. And I don't know how we can necessarily influence that. On the other side, um, we send women overseas in exchange, military exchange programs, education programs, and in equal percentages that, that they have in, in our own military. At least that's my understanding, that there's no discrimination there, there is a, if there's a push to get as many women over there as, as want to go. So I'll, I'll turn over to the ambassador. My suspicion is you're right. I mean, I think your suggestion is it's probably a lot more men than women, and I think there are so many military exchanges, and they're so skewed toward men mm -hmm. that that is probably so. And the flagship program that state runs, the International Visitor Leadership Program, you honestly get, you get points for actually for diversifying your pool. And so diversity looks different depending on where you are, but women generally, that's one of the things. They'll give you extra positions in a program if you manage to diversify your pool. So in London, for example, it met people who were you know, not white males, not from the greater London area. So that was one of the, there are incentives to try to diversify the pool. And when it's a tougher nut to crack, um, a friend of mine ran the program in the West Bank. Um, he had programs that were single country programs, absolutely about Palestinian women. So I know that in order to try to compensate for the you know, lack of participation of women, there are incentives built in to some of the government run program to try to right the balance. But I'm, I feel fairly confident it's not 50-50. I would just say I think it depends. Um, so I'm, I'm on the board of a college in Aix-en-Provence in France, which is a study abroad program. We have years of data going back. We have always had more women than men in this program. When, uh, for, for decades, it's been that way. And I look at other study abroad programs, I look at the ones we have through Arizona State, they also tend to attract more women than men to the study abroad programs. That seems to be a, a large pattern. Exchange programs depends on the program. But then you break that down and say, but where are you talking about? Is that in different parts of the world are going to attract men or women differently or, um, or deter women because of the cultural norms in some of the places that you may not want to go to. Um, so I just think it depends. 
And in terms of what kind of recommendation you pull out of that, um, I think what I would focus on um, is one of them, by definition, we're always going to have to look at safety. Uh, is if you're running programs, you're going to look at safety. You have to give advice and choose where do people choose to go. Um, the second is that we shouldn't compromise on our values as we send people abroad. It should be a sharing experience. So be respectful, but you know also try to tr try to go where we can develop uh, better understanding based on core human values. I think actually publics that we interact with understand that more maybe than some of the governments or religious authorities would. And that means that we're going to have to be making these choices case by case. And I'll say personally, this doesn't make my top 10 worries list because I see the exchange community being extremely attentive to this issue of diversity on many measures. And I see how hard my colleagues at IREX work to make sure we have diverse pools in all the programs we run. And I think we see the same elsewhere too. So do we have time for that one last question? Let's go ahead and, and take that. I have the microphone already, so. <laughs> Like it that's okay for you. Um, so, I, my name is Dennis, I'm from Germany. I'm an exchange student with a program that was refer referenced before, um, Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. Um, and I want to share a thought with you. So, the program I'm, uh, I'm uh, participating in is, uh, just recently was threatened by a cut of the funds by 50% by uh, the US Congress. And I feel like uh, the United States um, are trying to shrink their influence on uh, the European Union. And um, I just wanted to share that thought with you. Um, now that we have, um, last year we faced a lot of military aggressions from the Russian uh, Federation. And there's a scary amount, of, like, a scary understanding for that in my country. And I feel like this is a bad timing to um, not have an influence anymore. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. And um, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take that one to begin with because something I said made Kurt believe that I thought we should focus on places not where we're with our closest allies. And I want to correct the record. I think that where is where our emphasis needs to be. That's where, that's where we go for partners who share our fundamental values. And that's how, that's where we find the partners that we address a whole series of global challenges with. And I am um, concerned about any pulling back of our traditional transatlantic relationship. I think this is absolutely not the time for any lessening of opening, reaching across. You get, we get complacent as a country at our great peril. Um, even if we have strong allies, there are always huge pockets of people inside countries that are allies that don't know us well. And we have to nurture those ties to keep that fresh and alive with each passing generation. So I believe one of our most important imperatives right now is to keep the, the transatlantic ties as vibrant as um, they have been through my entire career. Yeah, absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. Well, I, I'll just talk about the military for a second, and you hit on it. When you look at General Breedlove's strategic statement from earlier this week and less potential threats, there's a new one in that list, and it's called Russia. Uh, so you're going to see an increased focus certainly on it with what Putin's doing in the Crimea, Ukraine, and Syria, uh, there's great concern there. So, uh, you know, that's got Congress's attention big time. Now, will that help the exchange programs? I don't know. Uh, I would hate to see them diminished in any way, shape, or form. In fact, maybe we ought to encourage, as the ambassador has said, uh, with all our NATO allies, uh, greater exchange programs. Yeah. And just to say, it's a policy issue as well as an exchange issue. That's kind of what you're getting at, is that. All, all this rhetoric about you know, pulling back or pivot to Asia or, you know, Europe do more, or, you know, let NATO lead or whatever that means. I mean, that, that um, is a mistake because we are still in a contest of ideas and of values. We still face real dangers and we ought to be prioritizing our relationships and our work together with other countries that share those values and those interests with us. Uh, that's how we're going to be most successful. So you're absolutely right. I think that has to become part of a policy focus in this country in addition to a, a, a human focus. Well said. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking General Cheney, Ambassador Stevenson, Ambassador Barker. <laughs>